Glory to the Lord. Welcome back. We're going to get into our Prophecy Pearls segment for you. How to authenticate a believer. Okay, I'll go on into it. All right, let's get into it then. How to authenticate a believer. We're going to look at... Huh? Well, I didn't send you anything because I was just waiting for you to run the Pearls intro. Say what? Oh, it was? My bad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was looking at, uh, you're right, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is like riding a bike, guys, and I just crashed and burned. <laughs> well, my knees are all scraped up. Uh, let's get back on the bike. <laughs> okay, we're going to authenticate authenticate a believer for you, okay? how How to authenticate a believer. There's several ways to do that. First, let's look at 1 John 2.19, okay? Not everyone who claims to be a believer is a believer, okay? 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. There is wheat and tares, sheep and goats, good and bad. And all of us are bad, okay? All of us are bad without Christ. But an authentic believer bears certain qualities. Now, this is telling us that the fakes among us, they go out from us at some point. They may hang in there and be a church member for 20 years and then take off and have a homosexual affair. This scripture right here tells us in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Now, if you've served Jesus for 20 years and then you just turn your back and you dive into sin, uh, you're proving yourself a fake, not a prodigal son, okay? You're proving yourself a fake if you do that. And that's according to this scripture. There's another, uh, there's a Bible test. Let's go over to 1 John. I'm using my electronic Bible here. First John, uh, let's go to First John chapter two, verse. Let's see, verse three. First John chapter two, verse three, and hereby we do know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. Are you keeping his commandments? If you're not, then let's see what it says about you. It says, he that saith, I know him, but keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Okay. If you're say, if you say, you know, Jesus, but you don't study the word and you don't have, you don't know it. How can you keep his commandments? If you don't know what they are, if you don't get the word in you, how can you have Jesus in you? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Here's the word, okay? This in you is Jesus in you. And he gives you the spirit and teaches you and gives you understanding and wisdom and knowledge. But you have to study, okay? You have to seek him. Now, this here it says, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. That is how we know that we are in him. We keep his commandments. He's important to us. We love him. We adore him. We want to please him. We don't keep his commandments to avoid hell. We keep his commandments because we love him and we want to be pleasing to him. And we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to disappoint him, although you can't disappoint God. But um, since he knows everything ahead of time. But that's, let's go over to the chat room. Do you guys have any uh, questions thus far? We're going to get into some more areas of how you know. Hi, everybody. Glory to the King. If you have any trouble, uh, just refresh. I don't think I don't think you'll have any trouble with the live feed today. Everything looks is looking real good. But uh, if you do, just refresh. Now I don't see any questions. He, you're right, Shirley. He is everything. He's awesome. Okay. Now another way that you know a real believer is the fruits. The Lord Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, he talked about how, let me get this, the scripture about the good tree and the bad tree here for you. If you don't use a concordance, you need to, to use one to study, okay? That's how you look up all of a certain word where throughout the Bible, just like, um, let's see, what am I looking up now? Oh, I'm looking up the word tree. Tree is not found in a lot of places, but I know it's New Testament, so it brings up all of the instances in which the word uses the word tree. Now, here we go, Matthew 7. Let's go over to get your Bible. We're going to go into, here we go. Now let's start at verse 15 of Matthew 7. Shall we pray? Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you with all of our hearts that you're our God. Almighty King of heaven, I surrender unto you all that I am. Permit us, Lord, to sit at your feet and learn from you. Teach us, we pray. And we love you so, so, so much and look forward to your return in Jesus' name. Mwah! Amen. Okay, let's get into this scripture. In Matthew chapter 7, we're going to start at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. That means they look like believers. If they're coming in sheep's clothing, that means they're, they're pretending to be a sheep, doesn't it? They're pretending to be a believer. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. That's what Jesus said. These are red letters in the word. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, what happens with the trees? We are the bad trees, all of us. Okay? We are the corrupt trees. Jesus is the good tree. He cannot bear bad fruit. We're the corrupt trees. And we cannot bear good fruit. Okay? But Jesus in us can bear his good fruits through us. And when you see the fruits of the Spirit, see, we are not able to produce the fruits of the Spirit on our own. We cannot self-generate things like love and peace, and joy, and all the fruits of the Spirit. Those are His fruits. That's why they're called the fruits of the Spirit. We are not able to self-generate any of those fruits. The only fruits we can produce 
naturally are bad fruits. But if we are grafted in to the vine, we are branches that are grafted in. And because if Jesus is in you and bearing his fruits through your life, then you're bearing good fruit, aren't you? That's the only way you're ever going to bear good fruit is if Christ in you is bearing his fruits through you. Okay? We are the bad trees. He's the good tree. Without him, we cannot bear good fruit. With him, we can. Anytime you see the fruits of the Spirit, you find Jesus in a person. Okay? When you see those fruits. Let's go over to, just let's dash over here to Galatians real quick. Galatians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, I believe. Yes, but the fruit of the Spirit, here are the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. We cannot self-generate love. That's what this is saying. These are fruits of the Spirit. These are His fruits. He can bear these, but we can't. The only way you see these fruits in a person's life is if this is if Jesus is in them. Okay? And if Jesus is in you, you're a real believer. If you're bearing the, the fruits of the Spirit, you're a real believer. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Did you know that we cannot self-generate joy or love? Peace. Well, as you can see, look around in the world. There is no peace through man's methods. Long-suffering. That's one of his fruits and not ours. He's very patient and he's long-suffering. Gentleness, goodness, faith. You can't self-generate faith either. Did you know that? Meekness, that's his fruit. Temperance, against such there is no law. These are his fruits. And if you see them in someone, you know that Jesus is in that person bearing those fruits through them. That's evidence that he's there. Now, let's go ahead and look at uh, another scripture. Now, another way to, know, to authenticate a believer is through persecution. Let me snag another scripture for you. I'm going to go back into my concordance and I'm going to go into P and then look up the word persecution. That's how that's done. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, that didn't say some. It said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution is a sign that you are a real believer. Now, do you, do you love him? Religion is duty. Get rid of that. Okay? Relationship. How can you love someone you don't know? The very first and great commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Okay? Now, how do you love someone you don't know? It's impossible. Well, you say, well, why would God command us to love him if you can't command somebody to love you? He's saying, get to know me. You, every human relationship is built on a couple of things. It's built on two-way communication and time spent with one another, okay? Now, I was talking about this on my wall earlier today. You have to, it's built on time and experiences together and things like that. And interaction, two-way communication. Our relationship with God is the same way. It's based on two-way communication. If, 
As you read your Bible, that is God speaking to you. As you respond to him in prayer, that's you speaking to him. And you interact with each other. As you study, he will lead you all over your Bible and teach you things, okay? If you'll just allow him and get in there with a heart that really wants to know him. You know, let's go over to Matthew 25. And I want to show you something really interesting that I was studying today. We're talking about in Matthew 25, you're looking at the parable of the ten virgins. Now, let's go through this quickly. We've got about eight minutes here. We're going to go through this quickly, but I think you're going to find some really profound things in these verses on our topic today. Chapter 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now, those are... The virgins are those who claim faith in Christ, all right, which took their lamps. Now, the word is the lamp. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the lamps are the word. So they, they claim faith in Christ. They took their lamps, the word, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. You're looking at five flesh believers and five spirit believers. The flesh believers are not real believers. Okay? They're foolish. They're flesh. They are left. The door is shut and they're outside of it. Now let's keep going. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So they have the word, but they the oil is the Holy Spirit. They took their lamps and they took no oil with them. The Holy Spirit is given to the real believers, not the fakes. Okay? This says those were, that were foolish don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the oil in their lamps, which means they have no ability to interpret the word or understand what it's saying. They don't know what it means. It just looks like poetry to them. Okay? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The wise learn the word. They spend time in it. They obey the word. And when they obey the word, the Holy Spirit is activated in you. Okay? Through obedience to the word. So the wise have oil in their vessels. This is your vessel, your body. You have the wise have the Holy Spirit in their vessels. With the word. See, you have to have the Holy Spirit to interpret the word of God correctly. Now, let's go on to the next one. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So, what this means is as we all await Jesus' return, everyone, the real and the fake, all slumber and sleep. We, you know, we... um let the world suck us in at times. And we've got we've got to try to avoid that, if at all possible. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, the midnight is the darkest time before it starts kind of lightening up again. Okay? It's pitch dark at midnight. Now, midnight, that's our mid-trip print. Uh, that's our mid-trip point. Because that's when it's the darkest. That's when the temple gets defiled, and that's when all heck breaks loose, okay? So, at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And that's kind of like what the watchmen are doing. The watchmen are saying, okay, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And it's, and, and it's like, get ready, okay? In verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So when the cry goes out and they're saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, the fake and the real both get their Bibles out to brush up. <laughs> you know, they want to brush up on the word and make sure they're ready, right? But the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. They're saying, what does this mean? We don't understand it. 
They can't, they don't have the spirit to be able to interpret the word. They're reading it, but they don't understand what they're reading. So these are the foolish. They have, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't study the word. They don't pray. They don't pursue God. They are, um, you can't tell they are believers from their life and the way they live it. The only way you the only way you know they're a believer is because they tell you they are. You don't see any fruits of the spirit in them. In verse 9, but the wise answered saying, "Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Oil costs you." The oil does cost you. Let me make sure I know what I'm doing here. Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. What it's saying is that, you know, we would love to help you, but uh, we can't <laughs> We can't just sit, sit you down and tell you everything. It would just, you know, I, it's taken me years to lay all this out for my students that follow this, this these teachings. Now, as... Um, they have to go and study for themselves. They have to develop a relationship with Jesus for themselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. So see, they didn't get off their blessed assurance until Jesus was on his way. Then they're like, oh my gosh, what does it say? I can't read it. I can't understand it. The wise are saying, I got to get ready. I don't have time to explain it to you. And so then... Jesus shows up and it says in verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins. These are the foolish saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. They're praying. Oh, let me in. Let me in. I don't want to be left here. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. He's saying, I don't know you. Okay? There's another scripture in here also that says, you know, if, if you're my friend, why didn't you come when I called you? Why weren't you ready? If you're, if you're really my friend, why weren't you ready for my wedding when I came for you? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? He says, I know you not. Well, how do you know if God knows you? Well, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, that says that if you love God, he knows you. Okay? If you love God, you're not diving into sin head first. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back with our study in Revelation right after this. Mine. Your mind.